Good afternoon. Welcome to the committee's oversight hearing on select provisions of the 1866 Reconstruction Treaties between the United States and Oklahoma tribes. In, a, in the 1830s, the U.S. forcibly removed the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Muscogee Creek, and Seminole nations from their ancestral homelands in the southeast to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. At the same time, individual members of the five tribes enslaved black people, continuing to do so through the Civil War. In 1866, the five tribes signed treaties with the United States which further reduced their land holdings and contained provisions about emancipation of enslaved peoples who are collectively referred to as the freedmen. Now, for the first time in the history of the United States Senate, these sovereign signatory tribes, freedmen descendants, and the administration have an opportunity to present their views on the 1866 treaties for the record. I understand and acknowledge that this is a difficult conversation because this issue at its core involves injustices perpetrated by the United States government more than a century ago against both Native Americans and African Americans. It is emotionally charged for many and for good reason, years long litigation and disagreement over citizenship status of freedmen descendants among the five treaty tribes has divided communities and even divided individual families. But disagreements cannot get resolved in silence. And so we will soon be hearing from tribal leaders and representatives for each of the five tribes who will speak to their nation's treaty provisions with respect to freedmen descendants Representative Waters, who has fought for freedmen descendants' rights for years, particularly in her leadership of the House Financial Services Committee, as well as Marilyn Van, whose advocacy through her organization has raised awareness for freedmen descendants of all five tribes. And later this afternoon, I look forward to a deeper, deeper dialogue with individual leaders of freedmen groups. So it is our goal today to start a respectful dialogue to listen to different perspectives, both in a formal setting and informally among members of Congress, tribal leaders, and freedmen advocates, and to educate the committee and the public with informed accounts relating to our nation's two greatest failures, the removal of Native peoples from their traditional homelands and the enslavement of black people. Descendants of both, many here today, still carry the pain of those grave injustices. I look forward to a respectful conversation that takes into account this, the historic importance of this hearing. I'll now recognize Vice Chair Murkowski for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening today's very, very important and, as you have noted, a historic hearing. I apologize that I'm not there in person, uh, but COVID is keeping me here in Alaska for this week. The history of the post-Civil War Reconstruction Treaty Tribes, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muscogee, and Seminole Nations, often referred to as the Five Tribes, and the Freedmen, the lineal descendants of African-American slaves owned by the Five Tribes, is part of history that, that perhaps many Americans are not familiar with, nor do they fully understand. It is a complicated history of injustice and of sorrow for both Indian tribes and African Americans. And as you have noted, Mr. Chairman, this can be an uncomfortable discussion. It can be uncomfortable to talk about uh, what was brought on by the federal government's own policies of forced removal of Native peoples from their ancestral homelands and the enslavement of African peoples. I understand that each of the five tribes has a very unique history with freedmen based on separate treaties with the United States, so I am interested in learning more about what these treaties entail and the obligations of both the tribes and the federal government to freedmen descendants. So I do want to say how appreciative I am that the Indian Affairs Committee is examining this history and that the five tribes and the freedmen descendants are here along with the Department of Interior to have a constructive 
and again, a respectful dialogue about how we might move forward together. This is indeed long, long overdue. I agree with the chairman that we should task the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, with investigating what federal services the freedmen receive and should receive in the future from the federal government. And with that, I turn back to you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you for convening this very important and very substantive hearing. And for the many witnesses that are there in person today, thank you for traveling to be before the committee on a very important topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Murkowski, and we wish you a speedy recovery and look forward to seeing you soon. Are there other members of the committee wishing to make an opening statement? If not, we'll turn to our first witness uh, who uh, is a towering figure in history enough so that she comprises her own panel. Uh, we are um, pleased to uh, uh, introduce the Honorable Maxine Waters, U.S. Representative for the 43rd Congressional uh, District um, uh, in California. Um, Congresswoman, your full written testimony will be made part of the official hearing record, and we look forward to your remarks. Please proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, Chairman Schultz. Vice Chair Murkowski and members of the committee, Today I'm here to discuss an issue I care very deeply about, but has been ignored for far too long. Many remain unfamiliar with the history of those who came to be known as the Native American freedmen and the ongoing plight of their descendants. The freedmen were black individuals who were enslaved by five formerly slave-holding tribal nations and were forced to walk and suffer on the Trail of Tears alongside their slave masters. A year after the Civil War ended, the five tribes agreed to abolish slavery and accept freedmen and their descendants as full tribal citizens under the 1866 treaty agreements they made uh, with the United States government. Specifically, the 1866 treaties required the five tribes to abolish slavery and to agree to treat and accept formerly enslaved individuals and their lineal descendants as equal tribal citizens. For example, the treaty signed by the Cherokee Nation reads, and I quote, all native-born Cherokee, all Indians and whites legally members of the nation by adoption and all freemen who have been liberated by voluntary act of their former owners or by law, as well as free colored persons who were in the country at the commencement of the rebellion and are now residents therein or who may return within six months from the 19th day of July, 1866, and their descendants who reside within the limits of the Cherokee Nation shall be taken and deemed to be citizens of the Cherokee Nation, quote, unquote. The four other tribes all signed similar treaties. Despite the fact that these treaty obligations still exist and are binding on the five tribes beginning in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the tribes began to take formal actions to take away the citizenship rights of descendants of freedmen. For instance, in 1983, freedmen were prohibited from voting in Cherokee Nation elections and received letters informing them that their citizenship had been canceled. In 2007, the Cherokee amended their constitution to limit citizenship to only individuals who were, quote, Cherokee by blood, unquote. These actions led to years of litigation that was finally settled in 2017 when a federal district court judge ruled in favor of the freedmen and their right to citizenship. In this ruling, <clears throat> The judge stated, and I quote, in accordance with Article 9 of the 1866 Treaty, the Cherokee freedmen have a present right to citizenship in the Cherokee Nation that is coexistent with the rights of Native 
Cherokees, quote, unquote. Following the court decision, which the Cherokee Nation accepted as binding, the tribe has taken actions to comply with the decision and ensure that descendants of freedmen are treated as equal citizens. Before my committee, Cherokee Nation Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin testified that these actions have made the Cherokee Nation, quote, a better nation for having recognized full and equal citizenship of freedmen descendants. Despite the actions of the Cherokee to right the wrong inflicted on its freedmen, the descendants of freedmen of the other four tribes continue to be denied tribal citizenship and other basic rights associated with citizenship, like equal access to federally funded affordable housing. My committee even heard testimony last year that freedmen have even been denied access to life-saving vaccines during the ongoing pandemic. It was this testimony that prompted even the Biden administration to designate all Seminole freedmen as eligible for health care services, including the COVID vaccine, through the Indian Health Service. However, this, was the only, this only decision only applies to Seminole freedmen and not freedmen from the other tribes. We know that equal access to housing sits at the heart of many of the racial and economic injustices we continue to see across the country today. As chairwoman of the House Financial Services Committee, I recognize that Native communities face some of the worst housing conditions in the United States. It is also important to recognize that the legacy of land and cultural disenfranchisement has created and maintained these circumstances. That is why I propose providing $2 billion for affordable housing in tribal communities in my Housing is Infrastructure Act, and why I'm moving to reauthorize NAHASDA with language that ensures that descendants of freedmen have equal access to these resources, as the 1866 treaties promised. When Barney Frank, my, professor, my pre predecessor, was chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, he recognized the plight of the freedmen and was a staunch advocate for their rights. I worked closely with him on legislation to prevent tribes from disenfranchising their descendants. As ranking member and now chairwoman of the committee, I continue that fight for justice for the descendants of freedmen. Currently, there are tribes that are implementing federally funded programs in a way that actively discriminates against descendants of freedmen in direct violation of treaty obligations. Congress has every right to ensure that federal funding implemented in compliance with all relevant obligations. We must stand by the rights promised to freedmen and the treaties that guaranteed those rights over a century ago and hold these tribes accountable. I'd like to say how proud I am of the descendants of native freedmen who have never wavered in their fight for human dignity and equal recognition. Even when it seemed no one would listen, even with the growing movement for reparations that recognizes the forced and uncompensated labor that built this country and the riches amassed because of it, it seems that the fight of the descendants of freemen still has never been rightfully acknowledged and affirmed. This pandemic has made clear that the ongoing discrimination of the freedmen descendants can literally mean the difference between life and death for descendants of freedmen who have been denied COVID vaccines. So I urge the distinguished members of this committee, we must honor our word as a nation and uphold as honorable people the obligations of these treaties. This is as much true for the United States government which has failed to meet all of its treaty obligations as it is for five, the five tribes. This work is ongoing, and it is the obligation to the descendants of freedmen that can't be left out of that conversation. I want to thank again Senator Schatz for holding this important hearing and working with me on this issue. And I must 
uh, indicate that even though there appears to be only one uh, representative here uh, for the freedmen, I would like, uh, if at all possible, to make sure that the voices of other freedmen are heard in some sense, in some way. And while I'm pleased that the United States Senate is finally hearing testimony from a freedman descendant, I must state that hearing from more voices, not less, is the key to productive dialogue. It is when we don't expand our table to hear more from those who have been disenfranchised that injustices and systemic inequities are perpetuated. So moving forward, I'm convinced that we can work together to not simply uplift the voices of freedmen, but also to recognize the shared suffering of Native freedmen and Native Americans forced to walk that trail of tears together and the need to honor the treaties of 1866. I do not believe that the documented history of the descendants of freedmen can be ignored, forgotten, are dismissed any longer. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman uh, Waters. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Uh, members may submit follow-up questions uh, for the record, uh, and you are excused as we prepare our next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. If the panelists could take their seats as we're introducing them, I'd appreciate it. For our second panel, we have the Honorable Brian Newland, Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of Interior. The Honorable Chuck Hoskin, Jr., Principal Chief, Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. The Honorable Louis J. Johnson, Chief of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. The Honorable Michael Baraj, General Counsel, Choctaw Nation. The Honorable Jonadev Chowdhury, Ambassador, the Muscogee Creek Nation. Mr. Stephen Greetham, Senior Counsel, the Chickasaw Nation. And Ms. Marilyn Van, President, Descendants of Freedmen of the Five Tribes Association in Oklahoma. I want to remind our witnesses that your full written testimony will be made of the uh, part of the official hearing record and we would really appreciate it if you could keep your uh, remarks to five minutes um, because this is an extraordinarily um, uh, packed panel. Uh, and we will uh, start with um, Secretary Newland. Please proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks to Vice Chair Murkowski and members of the committee. It's great to be here uh, today. My name is Brian Newland. I have the privilege of serving as Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs here at the Department of the Interior. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to, pre to present the department's testimony at this important oversight hearing on select provisions of the 1866 Reconstruction Treaties between the United States and the five tribes in Oklahoma. Several of these treaty provisions provide certain rights and privileges to some freedmen who are people who were enslaved and later released from servitude by the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muscogee Creek, and Seminole Nations, called at times the Five Tribes. The department appreciates the opportunity to discuss these important treaty provisions. Each of the Five Tribes enacted laws supporting enslavement and or restricting the rights of enslaved people. In 1866, after the Civil War, each of the Five Tribes entered into treaties with the United States those treaties contain provisions addressing the status and rights of freedmen and persons of African descent residing amongst the five tribes. It is important to understand that there is no single treaty or uniform law that applies to all freedmen. The Cherokee Nation, the Muscogee Creek Nation, and the Seminole Nation each have their own treaty with the United States, and the Chickasaw and Choctaw Nations share a treaty in common with the United States. All four of these treaties have slightly different provisions relating to the freedmen. In 1896, Congress established a commission uh, to the five civilized tribes to prepare membership roles for each of the tribes in anticipation of allotting their lands. Congress directed the commission to determine applications for citizenship in each of the five tribes in accordance with their treaties and their laws. 
Congress also required the commission to make a role of freedmen entitled to citizenship in said tribes and to include their names in the lists of members. The final roles would remain with the Commissioner of Indian Affairs and be considered the true and correct roles of persons entitled to the rights of citizenship in each tribe. In the past half century, there have been disputes within some of the five tribes regarding the legal status of freedmen descendants. The Cherokee Nation resolved the dispute over the status of Cherokee freedmen utilizing its own judicial and political processes. In May of last year, Secretary Holland approved the Cherokee Nation Constitution that explicitly secures the citizenship and political rights of Cherokee freedmen. In a statement accompanying her approval, Secretary Holland stated that the new Constitution, quote, fulfilled the nation's obligations to the Cherokee freedmen and encouraged other tribes to take similar steps to meet their moral and legal obligations to the freedmen. In February, I participated in consultation sessions with leaders of the five tribes to consider the potential for some direct services to the freedmen from the BIA and the BIE. In particular, we asked the tribe's views on whether the Bureau of Indian Education should admit certain freedmen descendants as students at Haskell Indian Nations University and at Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute. We continue to review feedback and comments received from that consultation and have not made any decisions on a path forward. Determining eligibility for those services is a challenge for the department when considering uh, the freedmen descendants. The department generally defers to tribes to determine who is and who is not a tribal citizen. As uh, tribes have inherent authority to determine who qualifies as a tribal citizen. And as sovereign parties to treaties, tribes have an important role to play in interpreting those treaties with the United States. However, as Secretary Holland stated last year, the department continues to encourage tribes to take steps to meet their moral and legal obligations to freedmen descendants. Uh, the department's grateful to have the five tribes together here today along with Ms. Van, and we look forward to continuing our work with the five tribes and with the committee as we consider the legal rights and the status of freedmen descendants. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Newland. Uh, Chief Hoskin, please proceed with your testimony. LCO, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, what O for inviting me to speak today. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black once wrote that great nations like great men should keep their promises. Cherokee Nation is keeping our promise to the Cherokee freedmen and their descendants under our Treaty of 1866. That treaty, Mr. Chairman, is a living, powerful, and foundational document that ties together every one of our agreements with the United States. When we speak of our most important treaty rights, our reservation in Northeast Oklahoma, our right to a delegate in the House of Representatives, for example, we point to the language in the Treaty of 1866 which reaffirms all of our prior treaties, not inconsistent with that treaty. Cherokees must defend and we must preserve the Treaty of 1866. Article 9 of that treaty states that, quote, all freedmen and their descendants shall have all the rights of native Cherokees. Not some of the rights, all of the rights. Treaty obligations ought to mean something. Mr. Chairman, you can't pick and choose which parts of a treaty to uphold. <clears throat> We criticize the United States when it fails to live up to its treaty obligations, yet we in Cherokee Nation have a responsibility to live up to ours. For Cherokee Nation, the issue of freedmen citizenship was settled 156 years ago. It was settled in a treaty agreed to by the Cherokee people, ratified by this Senate and signed by the President of the United States. Our ancestors agreed in 1866 to forever cede the right to exclude freedmen and their descendants. This means that Cherokee Nation's past actions to exclude freedmen descendants from Cherokee Nation were void ab initio, void from the beginning. The enslavement of other human beings and the subsequent denial to them and their descendants of their basic rights is a stain on the Cherokee Nation, and it's a stain that must be lifted. Mr. Chairman, I offer an apology on behalf of the Cherokee Nation for these actions, 
just as important, I offer a commitment to reconciliation. I'm proud of the many actions that we've taken over the last five years towards reconciliation. In 2017, a federal district judge decided the Nash case. That case confirmed that the 1866 treaty remains alive and well and guarantees that descendant of descendants of Cherokee freedmen shall have, quote, all the rights of native Cherokees. To bring that matter to a close, Cherokee Nation did not appeal. The day after that historic decision, our own Supreme Court affirmed full citizenship for freedmen. We immediately began processing applications for citizenship from freedmen descendants. To this day, Mr. Chairman, more than 11,800 applicants have become citizens. In 2021, our Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the by blood language in our Constitution also violated our obligations in the Treaty of 1866. Our High Court determined that those words were invalid from inception and must be removed. As noted, Secretary Holland reviewed our Constitution later that year, and she wrote the Cherokee Nation had, quote, fulfilled their obligations to the Cherokee Freedmen. The Nash decision and our swift actions to implement it was a beginning, it was not an end. We understand that we must embrace the spirit of equality each day. For more than a century prior to the Nash case, Freedmen had been disconnected from the Cherokee Nation. Many in the Freedmen community did not have the same experiences, the same access to services, the same opportunities as non-Freedmen citizens. It's essential that we work to bridge that gap. So in 2020, I issued an executive order on equality, reiterating our commitment to that ideal. We also need to make sure that we are mindful of the Freedmen experience. So in 2021, I announced the Cherokee Freedmen Art and History Project, which seeks to ensure that Freedmen voices are represented within the Cherokee story. I'm proud to appear with my friend Marilyn Van, who I appointed last year to our Environmental Protection Commission, the first Cherokee citizen of Freedmen descent to hold a Cherokee Nation appointed government post. Mr. Chairman, I'm here today because it's a moral imperative that I be here. I'm here to proclaim that having finally kept our promise to Cherokee Freedmen, Cherokee Nation is a, be is a better nation. It is a stronger nation. Mr. Chairman, I'm here representing a great nation. What else? Thank you very much, uh, Chief Hoskin. Chief Johnson, please proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman and the rest of the committee. The Seminole Nation thanks you for this time to be able to speak. It has been requested in, of us to expand on selected provisions of the 1866 treaty. The communication to the Seminole Nation stated that in emails. A treaty wa was written to favor the necessities and the desires of the United States, although it stated to be mutual necessities. I will now expand from the preamble in certain articles of the 1866 treaty for the Seminoles. Selected provisions from the preamble, whereas existing treaties between the United States and the Seminole Nation are insufficient to meet their mutual necessities. And in view of the urgent necessities for more lands in the Indian Territory, requires a session by said Seminole Nation, a part of their present reservation, and is willing to pay therefore a reasonable price, while at the same time providing new and adequate land for them. The first phrase of the preamble is the opening words of the 1866 treaty. The existing treaty reference is the 1856 treaty which was in fact sufficient for the Seminole, for it consisted of millions of acres of land and provided in the language of that specific treaty that the desires of the United States were the determining factor for the Seminole being the only tribal nation of the Reconstruction Treaty era forced to cede every inch of their land. 2,169,080 acres was ceded at 15 cents an acre. The Seminole understood the 2,169,080 acres ceded was to be assigned to other Indians and freedmen. To live thereon, this promise was neither fulfilled nor honored. This language is present in Article 3 of the 1866 Treaty, and is the first time in the treaty where the term freedmen is mentioned. As stated in the preamble, a need for ceded land was for only a part, not the whole of the Seminole original, original initial reservation, it is a fact a reasonable price was never paid for the ceded land during this era, 15 cents an acre, nor was adequate sufficient land provided as understood by the Seminole. 
The first sentence of Article III reflected the intent of the United States as the Seminole understood it to mean. The 1866 treaty ultimately was not, uh, was not honored in totality by the United States because the intent of Article III was not adhered to. There are documents from all three branches of the United States government addressing this specific section of land. That fulfills my time at this time. I'm splitting my time with Assistant Chief Palmer. Assistant Chief Palmer, please proceed. Thank you. Majinita, Haraniram, Nadethuzlan Pum Bahoyan, Momen Pum, Ajogi, Dadi, Ajobagi, Sabaklet, Mongese. During opening remarks in the Hazda reauthorization one year ago on this date, the following was stated. The United States signed more than 370 treaties, passed laws, and instituted policies that have come to define the special government-to-government -government relationship between the federal and tribal governments and obligates the federal government to promote the general well-being of Native American tribes, yet the United States has failed to provide that assistance. Any treaty must be viewed through the author's eyes and those who reluctantly agreed to it. Weighted consideration must be given to the government's chosen language, intent, and the atmosphere in which it was constructed 156 years ago. This is how the U.S. Constitution is viewed. This is how the treaties are viewed. Article two of the Seminole Nation Treaty of 1866 reads, in part, many persons of African descent and blood who have no interest or property in the soil and no recognized civil rights shall be permitted to settle, have and enjoy the rights of all native citizens, equally binding laws, and may be adopted as citizens or members. The Dawes Commission certainly categorized freedmen and Seminole separately and introduced blood quantum. Phrases and terms utilized within the treaty are not the words of the Seminole. They're the words and desires of the federal government. This short testimony to discuss select provisions is a disservice to the Seminole and warrants a deeper conversation. Grossly negligent oversights of the treaty agreements still occur beyond the McGirt case. The government must account for and consider the impact any decision may have on a financially <clears throat> fragile tribal system that has yet to overcome historical poverty caused by previous lack of protection defined by the treaties in times of war and hostility, loss of valuable oil and land, and continual suffering from the historical trauma caused by the Indian Removal Act. As an elected official under the oath of office of the Seminole Nation, I must hold the, uphold the treaty, the tribal and U.S. Constitution, the tribal codes <clears throat> as they are written and as they govern the Seminole. Mado. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Burridge, uh, please proceed with your testimony. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Burridge. Burridge. Yes, Senator. Thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Shaw, it's Vice Chairman Mikowski, Senator Langford, and Senator Smith, and all of the distinguished members of the committee. My name is Michael Burridge. I am general counsel for and a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I'm here at the request of and on behalf of the chief of the Choctaw Nation, the Honorable Gary Batten, who the committee invited to testify on a matter of grave importance to the integrity of the Choctaw Nation. I began representing the Choctaw Nation in 1974 upon graduation from the University of Oklahoma College of Law. At that time, I moved to Antlers and began my law practice. I have represented the Choctaw Nation ever since that time in 1974, except for an approximate seven year period when I was appointed by President Clinton to be a United States District Judge, being Chief Judge for five of those years and also serving on the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals by designation. I was told that I am the first Native American to be appointed to the federal bench. I want to make one thing very clear, and please listen. The Freedman issue as it relates to the Choctaw Nation has nothing to do with race. I repeat, has nothing to do with race. Tribal membership is based on blood, not race. Today, the Choctaw Nation tribal members includes African Americans, as well as those from other races. 
All members of our tribe share one characteristic in common. They are Choctaw by blood and they're all lineal descendants of Choctaw Indians. The Constitution of the Choctaw Nation was established by a United States District Court order dated May 9th, 1983 in an action entitled Morris versus Watt. With federal approval by the government on June 9th, 1983, I repeat, with federal approval by the federal government on June 9th, 1983, ratified by a vote of the tribal members, certified by the Choctaw Election Commission on July 25th, 1983, this constitution approved by the federal government limits membership to Choctaws by blood and their lineal descendants. Chief Batten and I, as general counsel, counsel take an oath to uphold and defend this constitution. Our constitution has existed and worked well for almost four decades, but now another part of the federal government that approved that constitution wants to unilaterally walk it back without the consent of the Indians affected and without consent of the tribe. Does that sound familiar to you? When it comes to the federal government's treatment of Indians and Indian tribes? In the Choctaw Nation's recent litigation against the federal government over the unallotted lands, United States District Judge Lee R. West, who I served with and was appearing as counsel for the nation at that time, said the federal government has made many agreements with the tribes and did not keep them. He said that was not going to happen in his courtroom, and it did not. It is the federal government, by placing tribal membership in, in a political arena, that initiated this freedman issue, not the Choctaw Nation. If there's a problem, the federal government needs to find another solution that, do, that does not infringe upon the rights of the Choctaw people or the integrity of our self-governance. In 1978, in Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martin S., the Supreme Court held a tribe because of its sovereignty and principles of self-determination has the exclusive authority to determine its membership. Following this, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in Ordinance 59 Association versus U.S. Department of Interior Secretary held, I quote, tribes, not the federal government, retain authority to determine tribal membership. This holding should be honored by all branches of the federal government. The lawful interpretation of treaties, case law, and history that relates to Indians is complicated. There are special rules of construction when it comes to treaties with the tribes. We are here today having been drawn into a political process where decisions can have far-reaching legal consequences. I respectfully ask this committee, is a congressional hearing where time is limited and personal and political concerns are on the table the proper place to adjudicate such important matters as tribal membership? Then you add on top of that, legislative threats are made. If the tribe does not make the decision wanted by some politician, critical housing funds may, for tribal members that need the housing may be withheld. How can this be squared with the United States government's trust duties and obligations to the tribes? How is this anything that undermining the tribal self-determination and tribal autonomy? After surviving the cruelty of the Trail of Tears, the Dawes Act, the near termination of our tribal functions, and nearly two centuries of taking at the hand of the United States government, the Choctaw Nation and these other tribes deserve better. This all goes to the core of the constitutional identity of a sovereign tribe that is threatened. Thank you for your attention to this matter, and when appropriate, I'll be glad to answer any questions about what I have said or other questions, especially about the Morris case. I was there. Uh, I represented the tribe, although at that point in the game, I was carrying briefcases more than lawyering, but I know what was discussed at those hearings, and this was one of them. Thank you very much. Ambassador Chowdhury, please proceed with your testimony. Mado, I've got a long history with these buttons. Do I have it right, sir? You've got it right. You're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. Ixchi, Janda Vosula Chowdhury, Jezefkados, Hazagnamisi, Ibufunga, Amalga, Bukmitus. Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, members of this esteemed committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is John Davosiola Chowdhury, and I'm proud to serve as ambassador of the Muscogee Creek Nation. As I sit here before you today, the sovereignty of all tribal nations is under attack. Two years ago, the Supreme Court upheld our nation's sovereignty in McGirt versus Oklahoma. Just this past month, however, the court chose to abdicate it 
in order to placate Oklahoma politicians. Congress has a duty to protect the sovereignty of all tribal nations. That duty is all the more pressing when one branch of the federal government seeks to eliminate it. The Freedmen issues trace their roots to injustices against both Native Americans and African Americans. It goes without saying that slavery is and always has been wrong. And just as the United States fought a civil war over slavery, the Creek Nation fought its own civil war. On one side were the traditionalist Upper Creeks who opposed the imposition of colonial American life into our nation, including the legalization of slavery. I'm a descendant of Fish Pond and other Upper Creek towns. My mom used to explain family oral history stating that when our family and other Creeks would raid slave owners, we would give freed slaves three options. One, receive our assistance for passage to the North. Two, live among us and with us. Or three, join an autonomous black community within the larger Muscogee world. However, these practices conflicted directly with the goals and desires of the most prominent lower Creeks who sought to fully assimilate every aspect of white American culture into the fabric of our nation, including slavery, cotton, and Christianity. Instead of allowing the conflict at Creek Nation to play out through our own internal democratic processes, the United States intervened and dispatched General Andrew Jackson to exterminate the Upper Creeks. The United States' goal was nothing less than complete annihilation. In eight months of massacres, the United States burned nearly every Upper Creek home and murdered thousands of men, women, and children. My ancestors from Fish Pond sought refuge at Horseshoe Bend on the Tallapalooza River in Alabama, and they were slaughtered by Jackson and the slave-owning Cherokee leaders, John Ross and Major Ridge, who volunteered to fight with them. At Toa Hoshji, Jackson locked 50 men, women, and children in a cabin and burned them alive. Horseshoe Bend and the scores of massacres that preceded it silenced the strong anti-slavery faction within the Creek Nation. Jackson's extermination policies against the Upper Creeks created Alabama and resulted in the Indian Removal Act and ultimately the Trail of Tears. Even so, thousands of Creeks fought on the side of the Union in the American Civil War. Once again, we were targeted. Our homes burned and hundreds died. In exchange for our loyalty, the United States promised that once the war ended, our nation would not lose any land and all of the loyal Creeks would be financially assisted. Both promises turned out to be lies. The Treaty of 1866 has often been characterized as a reconstruction treaty. For us, it was not. It was a land grab that stripped us of half out of our reservation by force. And my great-great-grandpa up Knee Hill, who fought for the Union, said, the final payment from the United States wasn't enough to buy a hat. It is important to note that we are not Cherokee Nation. We are not Chickasaw Nation. We are the Muscogee Creek Nation. Our treaty with the United States contains different language than the treaties of other tribal nations. Our current constitution was reviewed and approved by the Department of the Interior. However, the interpretation of this treaty is currently the subject of ongoing litigation. Any true solution must go beyond the shallow political rhetoric and the yes-no binaries that such rhetoric supports. To that end, we've begun a process at Muscogee Creek Nation of developing historical, cultural, and legal research that will help our citizens engage in a thoughtful, informed exploration of this issue as they exercise their sovereign right to determine the future of the Muscogee Creek Nation. The Muscogee Creek Nation is proud of our diverse citizenship. We have citizens who have mixed ancestry, who are also white, African-American, Mexican-American, and many other heritages. I, myself, am Creek and Asian. But whatever else we may be, we are all Creek Indians by blood. And as a nation that has endured policies intended to exterminate us because we are Creek Indians by blood, Citizenship and issues involving non-Creek persons engender deep, conflicting emotions. Quite frankly, our citizens stand on both sides of these issues. We are working towards healing. We are not only the descendants of select families that own slaves, but also those who opposed slavery and incurred the targeted and murderous wrath of the United States military. 
But the solution to this is not another colonial intervention by the United States. Maro. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Greith, Mr. Greetham, please proceed with your testimony. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Schatz, uh, Vice Chairwoman uh, Murkowski, and honorable members of the committee. Um, my name is Stephen Greetham. I serve as senior counsel to the Chickasaw Nation. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, the committee called this hearing to inquire as to freed person descendants tribal citizenship rights under eight, various 1866 treaties. For Chickasaw, this inquiry is controlled by Article 3 of our 1866 treaty, a treaty to which the Choctaw Nation is also a party. The United States Supreme Court adjudicated the committee's question more than a century ago. Consistent with that adjudication, we have not violated, nor are we violating, our treaty. But before I go further, let me state plainly. Human chattel slavery is a stain on history. It is a stain on the continent's history, on the United States' history, and on Chickasaw history. Likewise, Jim Crow is a stain on the United States and Oklahoma's history. There's no room for ambiguity on those points, and nothing I say today should be interpreted as suggesting any ambiguity. Relevant to the committee's inquiry, the Chickasaw Nation's 1866 treaty provides for a land session to the United States, but conditions federal compensation on the nation's choosing to extend citizenship to freed persons. That choice was neither made nor supplanted by the treaty, which only spoke to the consequence of whichever choice the Chickasaw made. The Chickasaw people deliberated and chose not to extend citizenship. In doing so, the Chickasaw expressly relinquished any claim to compensation for the lands the United States took. This choice was not a violation of the treaty, but its implementation. And of course, as the Supreme Court recently quipped, history did not stop in 1866. In the wake of restored treaty relations, the U.S. again broke faith. Giving in to non-native political pressure, Congress turned its efforts to undermining tribal self-government and opening indigenous lands to non-native settlement so Oklahoma could be formed as a brand new state. It should be remembered that throughout this period, Chickasaws themselves were not U.S. citizens, though they and their rights remained subject to Congress's claim to plenary authority over Indian affairs. In the chaos resulting from this pressure campaign, disputes over freed person rights arose. And in 1902, Congress directed us to court. And by us, I mean the United States and the Chickasaw Nation and the Freedmen and the Choctaw Nation. Here's Congress's language. Authority is hereby conferred on the Court of Claims to determine the existing controversy respecting the relations of the Chickasaw Freedmen to the Chickasaw Nation and the rights of such freedmen in the lands of the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations under the third article of the Treaty of 1866 between the United States and the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations and under any and all laws subsequently enacted by the Chickasaw Legislature or by Congress. In considering the case, the court concluded, one, Congress had not independently vested freed persons with citizenship, and two, the treaty did not impose an obligation for the tribe to do so. Instead, the treaty provided for potential citizenship. As the Court of Claims put it, quote, a means whereby freedmen might, by consent of the tribe and the voluntary action of former slaves, become members, close quote. Based on treaty text and the party's actions, the court ruled freed persons were, quote, freed persons, quote, relation to the Chickasaw Nation is, as the treaty expresses, the same as citizens of the United States in the nation. This remains a true statement of law and fact today. And again, the statement represents treaty implementation, not violation. Treaties matter. They're the supreme law of the land. The federal legal system both produced the Chickasaw Nation's 1866 treaty and adjudicated its meaning more than a century ago. We are both the Chickasaw Nation and the United States bound by the court's disposition of the matter. Mindful of questions the law does not answer though, Chickasaw stands by this process and result. All peoples work to reconcile their often complicated histories over time. The U.S. and Chickasaw signed the 1866 treaty during a difficult period in our shared history, a period in which the United States began its own process of reconciling its dehumanizing reliance on human chattel slavery. We're more than 150 years on now, and that process continues, as it should. But the law matters. Chickasaw history, like other histories, involves growth and setback, trial and progress. 
In its most recent generations, the nation has made tremendous progress in rebuilding its governing institutions. Today, it employs thousands, both Chickasaw citizens and, like me, non-citizens. It invests in communities throughout its reservation, Oklahoma, and the region. It is dynamic and its work is ongoing. It remains committed to this rebuilding effort and it engages in it consistent with the law and its people's right to sovereign self-determination. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today and thank you for the opportunity to start a conversation. Thank you very much. Ms. Van, please proceed with your testimony. Greetings, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be a hearing witness. I am Marilyn Van, president of the Descendants of Freedmen of the Five Tribes Association. I am a Cherokee citizen and a Freedman descendant. We support enforcement of 1866 treaty rights of Freedman descendants. The tribes allied with the Confederate States to protect black chattel slavery. The 1866 treaties ran at the creek Cherokee and Seminole uh, free and enslaved peoples and their descendants tribal citizenship rights. Choctaw freedmen were eventually adopted um, in 1885. Chick uh, Chickasaw freedmen were not members of the tribe at the time of the Dawes enrollment as per the federal courts. Um, Many descendants today need services the same as their by blood relatives. Poverty began of the, of the freedmen. During slavery, later freedmen suffered from race massacres, segregation, and redlining. Freedmen descendants disenrollment began in 1979. The freedmen, members of the tribes that were disenrolled, were not allowed to vote on the disenrollments or only in nominal uh, numbers. Currently, only Cherokee Nation works to fulfill its treaty uh, obligations to freedmen. As a result of past and current systemic racism, descendants need help of the senators. Uh, some uh, that need help include Creek Freedman descendant, Mr. Lovett of Oak Mulgee, a senior citizen on disability. He needs rental assistance. Can the tribes change without congressional and federal intervention? History says no. Cherokee Nation only came into compliance in 2017 after federal court decisions in Cherokee Nation v. Nash and Van and passage of Freedman Protective Language in the 2008 Nahasta Reauthorization Act. Even today, some council persons and candidates for tribal office run anti-freedmen rights campaigns. The Seminole Nation um, has worked to exclude freedmen descendants from receiving almost all services, even after losing the Seminole Nation v. Norton case, federal case, in 2002, and receiving directions from the DOI and HUD that the freedmen citizens qualify for services. Their leadership has branded the freedmen as citizens rather than members, which legally means the same, and reissued freedmen tribal IDs that state zero blood quantum and voting benefits only. The Seminole tribal government has told other tribal nations and federal agencies the freedmen citizens do not qualify for services. In October 2021, Seminole freedmen began receiving medical services after the IHS sends orders to all chiefs and tribally operated health units that the freedmen citizens qualify for the health services. This came after my visits to the Rockville IHS headquarters with Seminole Councilwoman Sampson, who is here today, requesting urgent help. The freedmen elders dying from COVID-19, such as Mr. Thomas, uh, whose wife was on the council, was covered by the national press when tribal and IHS COVID vaccines were denied to Seminole Freedmen um, tribal citizens, but given to other members of the tribe. The Muscogee Creek Nation stresses the validity of Article 3 of its 1866 treaty, which confirmed the reservation, Seamagurt v. Oklahoma, but is silent on Article 2 of the same treaty, 
that granted the enslaved people and their descendants the right to share in the national funds and all the rights of Indians. Um, Article 2. Greek freedmen descendants went to tribal court but have been waiting for a judge to be assigned to the case since February 2021. The Creek Nation issued $4,500 checks from COVID-19 funds to each by blood citizens. Not a nickel went to the Creek Freedmen, a clear violation of that treaty. By the way, the Seminole Nation leadership denied the Freedmen citizens its share of the COVID funds as well. This committee can assist the Freedmen. Here are some suggestions. We ask Congress to write legislation that includes Freedmen descendants in appropriations, new programs, or reauthorization of old programs or entitlements that benefit the nations. This must be done by congressional language. The DOI can register Freedmen descendants, giving those that provide proof of descendancy of a Dawes and Rowley a letter confirming the person is a treaty heir who qualifies for federal services. We request field hearings or local listening sessions to be held in Oklahoma by, by members and staff of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs so more voices can be heard. We ask for investigations and CRS reports on the Freedmen Treaty issues. These do not equate citizenship but would be a start. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank all of our uh, testifiers. Uh, really uh, extraordinary testimony. All of you deeply professional, deeply knowledgeable, obviously not in agreement. Um, some intense frustration expressed. I respect that. Um, uh, these issues, as I said before, are foundational to uh, people's identity, uh, to communities, to tribal identity. Uh, and so I just wanted to acknowledge the, professional with, the professionalism with which uh, you all delivered your testimony. I'll start with uh, Mr. Newland. Um, I understand the department is currently gathering data related to freedmen eligibility for certain federal benefits. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about what's going on in that process and uh, how it's coming along? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So as I uh, mentioned in my testimony, uh, we had uh, conducted consultation, formal government to government consultation with the five tribes uh, back in February, we received, in addition to sitting down and having a conversation on some of these same issues, we received comments. Uh, and the question was whether to uh, admit uh, non-tribal member freedmen descendants as students at Haskell and, and Sippy. Uh, one of the challenges uh, with that is that the, the BI is not currently uh, set up in a way where we have the capacity to make determinations about who would and would not be eligible. We typically rely upon tribal, uh, tribal governments for membership and citizenship questions. And so uh, we haven't yet you know, decided on a, a, a definitively on a course of action coming out of that consultation, but those are some of the issues that we were considering. Uh, so uh, I, I'm sort of assuming you can't answer this question, but um, based on the data that you're gathering so far, do we have a ballpark number of how many Freedmen descendants, descendants have equities across the five tribes? I don't have that number, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, there, there's been talk, um, Ms. Van's testimony talked about a CRS report. There's been talk among staffers uh, about a GAO report and just cards on the table as I'm thinking about the path forward, um, that strikes me as an important first step just to sort of set a baseline of how each of the five tribes are in a different situation, um, both in terms of their treaty obligations, but also their, their current view of the issue and where they may or may not be in pending litigation. Um, but also some baseline data about how many people are we talking about, mm -hmm. right? What percentage of the current roles would this constitute? What kind of resource requirements would that uh, implicate? And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about a GAO report to try to get a level set here about um, the, the history, the legal aspects, the mechanics of conducting a role, 
the, I know something about this from the Native Hawaiian community, the, you know, the blood quantum questions, the lineal descendancy, they're not so easy to settle. And so even before you get to the potential for public policy in this space, you need to know what the facts are. And so I'm wondering what you think about that. Mr. Chairman, we, uh, we would be happy to, to work with the committee to um, and better understand kind of how that uh, study would be set up. Uh, but you hit the nail on the head that uh, you know, simple descendancy does not, uh, in and of itself, doesn't necessarily mean that somebody would be an eligible freedman descendant because each tribe has a, a slightly different citizenship requirements. That, um, and so the short answer to your question is uh, uh, we'd be happy to continue those conversations to, to look at how we would better define the universe here. My final question before I turn it over to Vice Chair Murkowski, and I'll do a second round to try to ask some additional questions. Uh, Chief Hoskin, uh, you testified that the nation has approved and processed uh, just under 12,000 uh, citizenship requests. Do you have an idea of, was it an initial rush, and, and now you just have a few coming in in the sort of regular order, or are there a lot of requests still pending for processing? How is this working? There, there was an initial rush because of the obvious uh, news of the court decision and how we embraced it. Um, but the number has grown steadily. So uh, when I testified before a House committee uh, earlier this year, we were somewhere in the neighborhood of the 8,000 range. And so that gives you an idea. Now we're closing in on 12,000. Now we are the largest tribe by population in the United States coming on to 440,000 citizens in that neighborhood. I think as we go out and engage in our outreach, Mr. Chairman, we are encouraging more people to sign up. And it's a rigorous process, and it should be, uh, but we are doing outreach, and I think that's why you see our numbers continue to grow. I don't know what the ceiling is, and I don't know right now whether we can get the committee this information, what our pending applications are, but we process thousands of applications for citizenship every month for Cherokee, potential Cherokee citizens of all sorts of descent, uh, including Cherokee by blood and freedmen. So I think that number is just going to continue to grow. Um, and just before I turn it over to, to, to Vice Chair Murkowski, just for the, for the other representatives of the tribes, um, whether over the table or in subsequent correspondence, I am going to try to get some fidelity on how many people we're talking about for each of your tribes and, and what percentage of your current membership that may comprise. I understand that is sometimes sensitive information, given that you are sovereigns, uh, and so I want to be respectful of that. But I also think for decision-making purposes, we need to sort of understand not not just the legal and moral and historical implications, but how many people are we talking about? And if it is a resource question, what it would cost to address. Um, so so just to let you know those questions are coming and I'm sensitive to the, uh, to the idea that maybe you don't want to give me incredible precision um, with a microphone on. Um, Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'd like to begin with a question to you, Assistant Secretary Newland. Um, when Secretary Holland approved the Cherokee Nation's new constitution guaranteeing false citizenship, uh, she did state very clearly, tribal self-governance is the best path forward to resolving internal tribal conflicts. We encourage other tribes to take similar steps. But as we have heard very clearly today, the, uh, the, the treaties that the five tribes are under are very different and therefore the obligations to the freedmen um, and their descendants uh, are at, at, at question here, of course. So the question to you is, if, if the tribe's treaty does not require it to extend membership to freedmen, what, what federal obligations does the federal government have to the freedmen and to their descendants? And I guess a follow on to that would be if there are any administrative authorities that the Department of Interior possesses that uh, could be utilized to address the concerns. You, you indicated that consultation has been underway and uh, uh, discussions about um, uh, BIE and BIA uh, and, and the department has not determined yet how to move forward. But can you speak again to the federal obligation and, and also to potential administrative authorities? 
Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I want to make sure I, I, I'm understanding your question correctly. Are, are you asking if, if a freedman descendant does not have a legal uh, right to tribal citizenship, at that point, what would the United States obligation Correct. be? It, what it, would the obligation be then to the freedmen and to their descendants? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. It's, it, it, if there's no legal right to tribal citizenship, it's, it's not clear then that the United States would have a trust uh, duty uh, to any individual as though they were, um, as though they were Indian or as though they were a tribal citizen. And so what about uh, any administrative authorities within the department to, uh, to address some of the concerns that we have heard articulated today? Um, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. You know, this has been a, this has been a difficult uh, question for us to, to answer. Um, it, it, I know some folks uh, uh, here in the room have views that it, these these questions are clear. The answers are clear on their face, but in terms of uh, how we would uh, administer direct services to freedmen descendants, again, it's it, it's very difficult for us uh, to put that into practice through the BI because we're we're simply not set up or not constituted right now to make determinations about who would be a, a lawful or legitimate freedman descendant um, entitled to those services and, and who would not be. And so um, I guess the answer to your, your question is it's, it's, it's just not clear today what administrative capabilities we would have. So let me ask yet probably another hard question, and that is uh, a recognition that as, as sovereign parties to treaties, Tribes clearly have an important role in interpreting the meaning of the treaties, but the United States is also hmm. the other sovereign party to the 1866 treaties that are signed by the five tribes. So <clears throat> the question would be, what role does the United States have to interpret and enforce the terms of these treaties as, as the other signatory? Um, probably not, not easy again <laughs> for you to respond to. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. You know, they're all hard questions, um, which is why we're, I, I think we're here in this, in this setting today. Um, it, it, both sovereigns that are, uh, are party to a treaty have a responsibility to fulfill the terms of the treaty and also have a right to, uh, uh, to help determine the treaty uh, in its meaning. Um, it, you know, I think the, the Cherokee Nation's journey uh, here is a, is a, a great example of uh, the mix of uh, uh, diplomacy between the United States and the Cherokee Nation, but also the Cherokee Nation exercising its inherent sovereign powers uh, through its own political processes and its own judicial process uh, to resolve these questions um, without conflict or having a, an outcome imposed upon them uh, from uh, from outside the nation, and so I think the United States has 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 that ability as well as a sovereign party to the treaty. But uh, you know that can be. I think the best way to resolve those is within the tribe and through the nation to nation relationship. Assistant Secretary, hopefully this is very quick and very easy. But uh, the Seminole Nation claims in their testimony that there's still some federal services that require the the uh, CDIB cards, the um, certificate degrees of Indian blood cards. Uh, these are including services that are provided by both BIE, BIA and Indian Health Services. Can you just share uh, with me whether or not a CDIB card is a federal requirement for eligibility to access BIA programs and services? Uh Madam Vice Chair, uh, typically we we refer to somebody's uh, a person's uh, status as a tribal citizen or tribal member for the delivery of those services, and in 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 most cases, and I believe with respect to all five of the tribes represented today, they uh, they perform the CDIB functions under contract with the BIA um, under their tribal government authority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm well over my time. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to you, uh, Chairman Schatz, and to Vice Chair Murkowski for this important hearing to discuss these respective treaties um, of 1866. I want to thank each of our esteemed witnesses uh, for taking time to be with us today and for all of our constituents who are here um, as well to participate in person and for everyone that is participating virtually as well with this important conversation. My first question is for Chief Hoskin. How has recognizing Cherokee freedmen as Cherokee citizens affected the Cherokee Nation? Well, I think it's affected us in a positive way. I mean, Mr. Chairman, there is, or, or, or Senator, there's something about living up to what we see at Cherokee Nation insofar as our 1866 treaty is, is an obligation. And we think treaties are solemn promises. So that in and of itself, I think, uh, does something for the Cherokee people. Uh, I also think that exploring a part of our history that we have frankly suppressed collectively, individually, uh, and are now doing the opposite, embracing it is good. Frankly, it's good for the United States to uh, take some scrutiny of its own history. I can say that as a chief of the Cherokee Nation because the United States has suppressed Cherokee history collectively, individually. We have to look in the mirror and we have to recognize that we've done the same. Embracing Freedmen history, going into communities where many Freedmen descendants live for me as chief, I think it's made me a better chief. It is it is exposed me to some of the needs in that community that we need to work to meet. And so I just think it's been completely positive. I am not going to suggest that there hasn't been some difficulties in terms of our internal uh, you know, debates and discussions about whether this is what the treaty meant. I mean, Cherokees are certainly uh, uh, noted for disagreeing from time to time. We have a great and vibrant democracy in the Cherokee Nation and people have raised their voices. I think that's also been healthy, but ultimately we respect the rule of law. We respect our ancestors and our ancestors agreed 156 years ago that freedmen and their descendants should be uh, considered people that have all the rights of native Cherokees. Being able to say that is important. Lastly, Senator, when I come into this chamber or in any forum in which I am pressing the government of the United States to live up to its obligation, I do so as a chief of a nation that's living up to the obligations in that same document. It would be difficult for me, Senator, to come to this committee and press for treaty rights if I could not say to myself, we are living up to all of our obligations. That makes Cherokee Nation, insofar as our treaty is concerned, I think a nation in a stronger position than we, than we would be had we not done that. Thank you, Chief Hoskin. Assistant Secretary Newland, you mentioned in your testimony that Interior is continuing to review consultation feedback before it makes a decision on whether freedmen are entitled to enroll at Haskell Indian Nations University in Kansas and the Southwestern Indian Polytechnical, uh, Polytechnic Institute in New Mexico. Assistant Secretary Newland, although enrollment at BIA post-secondary schools is still under review, what are some direct federal services that freedmen with tribal membership are entitled to? Thank you, Senator Lujan, for the question. So if, if, if freedmen descendants are enrolled as tribal citizens, then they are, they are brought within the scope of our relationship uh, between the United States and, and tribal nations and, and would then be eligible for the services that the federal government provides to that tribe and its members. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Van, um, yes or no, are Cherokee tribal members with freedman status able to receive every direct federal service and right that the federal government provides to tribal members without freedman status? No. My follow-up is what federal services and benefits are they not eligible to receive despite having full tribal citizenship? When the Stigler Act amendments were made in 2008, uh, the Act of 1947, um, the language did not allow uh, freedmen tribal members slash freedmen citizens to uh, uh, inherit uh, restricted land 
from their relatives or spouses of, of their tribes, uh, and the land would retain its uh, restrictions. All, uh, one other thing is that uh, freedmen tribal members and freedmen citizens are being treated uh, differently um, when it co on the reservations when it comes to uh, criminal uh, uh, cases. Uh, and, I'm, and again, I'm talking about the McGirt decision. So those, those are the two areas. I appreciate that response, Ms. Van. And Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I do have other questions I will be submitting into the record uh, and to follow up with those that I've asked. Thank you for the time today. Thank you, Senator Lujan. Senator Langford. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you to all of you that are here. It's nice to see so many Oklahomans uh, here and get a chance to hang out with neighbors. And I uh, very much appreciate your testimony and for everyone uh, coming today, especially want to be able to thank Principal Chief Hoskins, Chief Johnson, uh, for coming here to be able to represent in leadership. All of you have done a great job uh, representing your tribe, and I especially want to recognize the two chiefs that are here as well. Uh, also, for Marilyn Van, uh, we met, I'm trying to think, 11 years ago uh, when you chased me down in a town hall meeting at a public library and cornered me in the room to talk about Friedman issues. And we're tenacious about that and has never stopped in the process. So you, you, you represent the Freedmen well. Uh, you have stayed very knowledgeable on these issues and have stayed tenacious uh, in the process on that. So it's great over a now decade long friendship with us that we have stayed in contact since then. You didn't scare me off when you cornered me in the room to be able to talk through issues and you still don't scare me off. Uh, and so uh, glad to be able to call you a friend as well. Uh, let, me, let me just ask a, a general question on this. Uh, and to just bring this out because the chairman's trying to be able to figure out how do we get to resolution so this is not another century from now and this same kind of hearing is still occurring. Uh, because many of you referenced these are resolved issues within our tribe. It's been resolved in law. It's been resolved through different treaties. It's been resolved through different arrangements. But it's clearly unresolved in some of these issues. So the, the, the key becomes how do we actually get to resolution on this? So can you describe to me the relationship uh, and the number of freedmen that are connected to the tribe uh, that we know of, as you mentioned before, uh, Chief Hoskins, about 12,000 at this point for the Cherokee Nation. The number and then also what is the current relationship there, whether it is voting rights, whether it is other benefits, or whether it's nothing at all. And that would be helpful just to be able to get some context for the record on that. Chief Hoskins, obviously yours is the easiest of this one, but. Yes, thank you, thank you, Senator. It is good to be here and, and to spend some time with you. Uh, at Cherokee Nation, citizenship is equal. Uh, I suspect my good friend Marilyn Van has the same thing with her that I have with me, which is a Cherokee citizenship card, which apart from our picture and name is indistinguishable. That's where it starts in terms of the symbolic representation of citizenship. But beyond that, there are equal rights. There are no distinctions between uh, Cherokee citizens of freedmen descent or Cherokees by blood descent. I would note for the committee that Cherokee Nation is even more diverse than that. There are Cherokee citizens of Shawnee descent, Cherokee, Cherokee citizens of Delaware descent. Those all stem, Senator, from that same time period, the period of post-Civil War. Uh, there is no distinction. I do want to note, if I could take the opportunity, uh, my friend Marilyn Van noted those two areas in which Cherokee citizens of freedmen descent do not have equal access. Those are two distinctly federal issues for which the Cherokee Nation would support any discussion, any dialogue on how to repair those. Those are not within the control of the Cherokee Nation. So to the extent, Senator, that it's within our control, equal rights is the order of the day at the Cherokee Nation. Okay. Chief Johnson, it's good to see you. Good to see you. So do you have a, an accounting of what that number might look like of, uh, for freedmen uh, that are attached to the Seminole Nation or in a relationship there and what, what that relationship is like? The freedmen are uh, numbered within the Seminole Nation uh, citizenship uh, about 2,500. Okay. And I want to I want to say some things on some things that's just been what I call innuendos and, and things. Uh, if anyone here has studied the history of the southeastern tribes, what you're going to find is that the Seminoles are totally separate in the areas of the relationships with people of African uh, persons of African descent. My land's longest wars in American Indian history was fought. Uh, between the United States, the Seminoles, and what they were called the Maroons. Uh, some of them were escaped slaves. Some of them were free people. That was freedom fighters that were fighting for the same cause, and that was to remain free. The Seminoles have always had the freedmen as their citizens since 1866. We had a Florida lands claims not too long ago. 
back in the 1990s. Uh, that was as a, as a Seminole Nation was recognized by Congress in 1823. The freedman was not, well, that, that the so-called freemen at that time uh, was not actually freemen. They were uh, persons of African descent, maroons, free slave, or, or escaped slaves from the South. So uh, they, they were not eligible for those judgment funds as deemed by Congress. Now, what we know as Seminoles is that since 1866, the freedmen have been citizens. They, get, they got two seats on the, on the tribal council, which is four seats on the tribal council. They can vote on measures that's passed by the tribal council, the Seminole Nation. Uh, if they come in for enrollment, they, they come in and they are enrolled as citizens. You know, customs among American Indians are very important. Now, I hear all kinds of words being said this day, but my lands, our, our treaty says that the terms of the 1866 treaty made it clear that said legislation shall not in any manner interfere with or annul the present tribal organization, the rights, the laws, the privilege, and the customs. It has always been the custom of the Seminole because the treaty says so. It says right here in the treaty that, uh, that its members are citizens. We had that choice to say members are citizens. So I see interchangeably that term being used, citizen, members, citizenship, membership, all that type of thing. And that might work for federal government, but in the customs of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma, freedmen the, and the descendants of the freedmen, there's no such thing as a freedman today. I think you know that. They're descendants of freedmen. And, I, and, and they uh, have always been by custom of the Seminoles. The Seminole Indians have been members of what? of the native bands, the 12 different native bands within the nation, and, the, and once after 1866 and the development of the, of the uh, freedmen bands, they have been members of those particular bands as well. But they have always been seen as citizens. And the customs of the Seminoles that became the specific tribes in Florida that became known as Seminoles, we have always been known as the members of those specific bands and that's in the Seminole Nation. So that's how the Seminole Nation sees it. That's our oral history. <clears throat> that's our tradition. And I believe the treaty actually actually supports those two terms being used. And that's how the Seminoles use them in this present day as well. Thank you, Chief Johnson. Michael Burge. Yeah, thank you, Senator. With regard to a, a path forward, well, before that, I don't have a number to give you. Okay. Maybe we can get that, but I, I don't have a number to give you. But with regard to a path forward, just, yeah, the, it, it's not so much a path forward as it is just a description of the current relationship as far as services, what, what may be different on that. There, the, the, the Choctaw Nation does not recognize the freedmen. Okay. And uh, that is because of the Constitution. But just one, one brief word on that Constitution that arose in federal court. The Department of Justice and the Department of Interior were in that case. There was specific discussion about how certain people would be treated, the adopted, the intermarried white, and the freedmen. Right. And a determination was made that it wanted to be Choctaw by blood. Delton Cox from Poto, Oklahoma, was on that commission. And I've talked to him, and he said this specific issue was discussed, and the federal government never raised an objection. They never raised the treaty issue. They never raised the freedmen issue and approve this constitution. We think that Choctaw Nation as a sovereign entity should be able to determine its memberships as set forth by the Supreme Court. Okay, thank you, Mr. Burge, thank you. John Duff, I'm yes, gonna call sir. you by your first name because we already know each other, so yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> so uh, g give us the approximate number uh, that's in a relationship if, you know, if it's known and then any other benefits or details or connection. I don't think specific numbers are known because the data is uh, notoriously challenging to to confirm the right. validity of. And along those lines, Creek Nation has been engaged in an active effort to compile data internally and uh, collect historic, cultural, legal information to help provide in background for citizens of Creek Nation to have an informed dialogue that's driven by facts, not by political rhetoric. And that informed dialogue, incidentally, um, may go beyond any specific treaty provision. I want to point this out because the treaty issue is uh, 
you know, it's been framed in very conclusory terms about what it says and what it doesn't say. But as I've said before, the treaty itself is working its way through our court system. But beyond that, this information gather, gathering that uh, our chief, Principal Chief Hill, uh, has, uh, has promoted as part of a national conversation will help inform conversations beyond simple treaty in interpretation. Any nation worth its salt has to, including the United States, has to regularly determine whether or not existing laws are consistent with the will of the people. And you need information, you need data to have that discussion. But I would, I would just say in a previous position, I was at an agency that uh, cited regularly uh, a statutory provision that is often cited in many watershed legislation in terms of Indian affairs. And that, and that legislation talks about the fundamental policy goal of the federal government is to support strong tribal governments. So whether it's through the judicial process of Muscogee Creek Nation or the, the public voting process of Muscogee Creek Nation, the federal government has a responsibility to support the sovereignty of the nation as it engages in this dialogue. It's important that it does so because, as I said before, colonialist History does not bode well in terms of efforts by the United States to impose its values on these sovereign nations. And we need to learn from history. So one way to turn sympathetic folks in this issue against a federal action is to impose solutions rather than have a true healing process within the nation that's fostered by information. And that's what we're engaged in right now right. in Muscogee Creek Nation. People may have concerns about time frames. People may have concerns about when things are going to happen. But any progress of any nation comes in its own time. Yes, we need to push for a conversation, but it can't be imposed by the United States. So uh, thank you, Senator. Your question about data is very well taken. The data, there are historic problems with the data, but we're internally looking at it. I, I, I caution against conclusory uh, positions regarding what one treaty position means or provision means without having the courts take a look. I get that. Re respect that. That's the area that the chairman's been working on for a while and trying to be able to think through how to be able to gather more data. The work that the Muscogee Creek Nation's already done will be very helpful in that process to be able to be informative uh, for a process like that. So that that's a helpful piece to be able to have. Yes. Uh, so I appreciate that very much. And I what, what I think you hear from this committee and certainly from the chairman is how do we work together in this process? I, I, don't, I don't hear a federal... Uh, federal action to be able to try to step on any kind of tribe in that it's uh, getting a chance to be able to partner together for things. Mr. Crethwood. Thank you. Um, it's just to define terms. Uh, Chickasaw Nation doesn't track freedmen right. or non-freedmen. There's Chickasaw citizens and non-citizens. Um, as I said, this, this was litigated over a century ago, so there aren't separate tracks of citizenship. There are just citizens. Right. Uh, many Chickasaw citizens are also folks who are descended from people who are held in bondage. Um, so they could be classified as freed persons, but they're also on the Chickasaw by blood roll, so they count as citizens. I have no number for you okay. as far as folks who are not on the Dawes Commission Chickasaw by blood roll, but are exclusively on uh, freedom roll. I have no number for you on Okay. All right. That, that's all very good. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask one follow-up question on it. So I apologize for going along. I'm getting, I'm taking my Oklahoma time uh, with Oklahoma folks here uh, in the process, but that's helpful. Thanks for just putting the, the context of that on the record uh, because that's helpful to be able to get the context on those, uh, all those issues. Mr. Newland, I do want to ask a slightly separate question on this just as a follow-up on it. Uh, there were two major Supreme Court decisions that have a very direct and immediate impact on Oklahoma. You know them very well as McGurd and the Castro Huerta uh, decisions on that. I, I need to ask you a question. If the Department of Interior or if you or anyone you know of is currently working on a legislative response for McGirt or for Castro Huerta. Uh, is there any ongoing work, either from technical assistance or writing? Because this has direct impact on every person that's here and on my state and the four million Oklahomans uh, that I represent. So is there any action that's currently going on that you or, or anyone on your team working on to develop a legislative response to Castro Huerta or to McGirt? Thank you, Senator. Uh, the executive branch has been asked to provide technical assistance on uh, legislative 
uh, language in response to the Supreme Court's recent decision. Okay. Was that only on Castro Huerta? Was it McGirt as well? Yes, Senator Castro Huerta. Would you be willing to be able to share that in my office as the, the senator for Oklahoma? Um, obviously, that has the direct impact on my state as well and all these folks that are here. Pardon? Can you? Would, would you be willing to be able to share that information with me? Because obviously, as the senator for Oklahoma, that has direct impact on my state. I, I don't see a reason why, uh, no reason comes to mind why we wouldn't be able to share that, Senator. Be great. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Langford, just on the question of TA, we, we, uh, I don't know who the TA is being provided to, actually, but I just want to make sure that they have the, if it's a member or a member office or a committee office, I want to make sure that they have the ability to work confidentially with counsel in the executive branch. And uh, But I, I can assure you that the conversations we've had privately about um, understanding that Oklahoma equities are, are, are well taken, but I just want to protect Secretary Newland's ability to work confidentially with whatever member or member office may be asking for TA. Sure. I, In I, fact, I, it, it could be my staff. I don't know yet. I, I, I respect that. My, my, my biggest <laughs> challenge is I, I don't ever want something being worked on or developed that's a piece of legislation that has direct and immediate impact on Oklahoma tribes and on the state of Oklahoma, and Oklahoma not actually be involved in that. Nothing about me without me. I got it. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I just have one uh, uh, final question for uh, Ms. Van, and I've lost it. Um, oh, got it. Um, Knowing that Congress's authority related to tribal membership is li limited by federal Indian law and the language of the treaties at issue today, what do you think can be done to further the cause of reconciliation? I think that although it got a little hot today, and I have no doubt that some people will leave this hearing, maybe even most people will leave this hearing feeling unsatisfied uh, not vindicated. Um, I consider this a success because we aired it out um, and um, people were heard. And um, I think it is important to move forward, but I think it is important to move forward carefully. Uh, measure twice, cut once. Uh, uh, we want to make sure that we move forward legislatively together. We want to make sure that sovereignty is respected but we also want to understand that African-American enslaved people um, and Native Americans were mistreated. And we are all in this situation because of the actions of the federal government of the United States. The official policy of the federal government of the United States ends up pitting African-Americans and Native Americans against each other in this terribly unfortunate historic circumstance. And so I don't have an easy solution. I think a GAO report is a reasonable start. I think dialogue is an important start. But I'm open to whatever suggestions you may have about moving forward as quickly as we can, but understanding that if we try to move too quickly, it will actually backfire and we will lose another decade uh, of potential progress. So I'm interested in your thoughts, Ms. Van. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am, uh, is a member of a, a tribe, um, I am, um, certainly I believe in tribal sovereignty, but the United States, of course, uh, does have a responsibility to the freedmen people uh, as per the treaty, not just to the uh, tribal chiefs and chairmen. Now, um, uh, decisions have been made uh, regarding the status of the freedmen by some na tribal nations, and this comes uh, in part after you know, Jim Crow laws, which put the persons of African ancestry on the bottom uh, of the deck here in Oklahoma. The, uh, so far as solutions moving forward, um, where there are some um, uh, case, uh, the freedmen have tried to uh, uh, do various things to try to uh, get equity under the treaty. As I said, uh, for instance, uh, there are... Uh, some Creek Freedmen descendants who uh, have been trying to use the federal courts and, and also the tribal courts, uh, as, as well as, of course, uh, coming up here to D.C. Um, and um, the, uh, 
we, we would like for the true history of the tribes and the freedmen to be there. So as I said, you know, that's one reason we're calling for studies because there have been some tribal leaders in the past who have said things like the freedmen were forced on the tribes or, or snuck in from Arkansas, although the, uh, there are federal records that say otherwise. So let's get the truth out there for what it is. So far as the, um, um, you know, I, I, I like this idea of continued dialogue, um, but um, as I said, the freedmen people, a lot of people are in need. Not all of that is the fault of the tribes. As said, some of that is the state of Oklahoma. And there were some tribal leaders in the past that were in elected position. I think there was uh, around 1907, there were some that were around uh, the, that were coming from some of the tribes that sat in Congress, that sat in the Senate, and they were opposed to uh, persons of African ancestry. I also want to mention that the freedmen people were not citizens of the United States until the other members of the tribe became citizens. Um, you know, our uh, citizenship was coming through the treaties. Now, um, so that being said, I made a few suggestions about, you know, possibly how the United States uh, can bring some relief uh, to the freedmen people uh, so far as some services. I know all of that's going to cost money, but I also want to mention the fact that back before, uh, back in those earlier days when the tribal governments were, were not, uh, were more limited until the Principal Chiefs Act was passed. In 1970, the, uh, the, the, the Bureau, they did um, a number of people, including the Freedmen people, sometimes for per capita payments. Uh, that happened, I know, in the Cherokee Nation. I know in the uh, uh, Creek Nation there were some per capita payments in the past. And so this sort of thing can be done, but again, it's going to cost some money. I get that. Um, so, uh, you know, in my 22-page report, you know, I have some other suggestions there. Again, we couldn't get to in the five minutes. So um, that's what I'm thinking. It's, it's going to take some time, some effort by the federal government. Um, I would like to, uh, uh, you know, and I understand that there were constitutions that were approved by the, um, by the federal government, but... Uh, you know, if freedmen people weren't allowed to vote on them, you know, well, and again, they've been signed. So there we are. Thank you very much. I'll thank uh, all of the testifiers as, as well as our first panelist, uh, uh, Chair Waters uh, from the U.S. House of Representatives. The hearing record will be open for one month to allow ample time for views to be submitted uh, for the committee's consideration. I want to thank all of the witnesses for their time and their testimony today. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.